everybody, welcome to this edition of the Microchip Livestream. Uh, as always, we're broadcasting to you live from our corporate headquarters here in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, this is your opportunity to interact with us, to ask a question, make a comment on today's topic, which is bringing analog signals into the digital world with PIC and AVR MCUs. So basically, how do you take analog signals and process them through uh, a digital system like a microcontroller? Uh, joining me in the studio today is my good friend, Daniel Ho. Uh, and we're going to send it briefly into the booth to Matt Dickens and Wayne Freeman, who are going to tell you how to interact with us, ask questions, and all about the prizes that we're giving away today. Hey, Mark, thank you so much. Yeah, welcome back to the live stream. Those of you that have been here before, those of you that are here for the first time, thanks for coming out and checking us out. I think we've got a uh, great show in store for them today. What do you think, I th Wayne? I think so. This is, uh, th I'm really excited to hear what Mark and Daniel have to say about uh, analog signals. Uh, I've, I've actually you know, just been uh, anticipating this moment for at least the last couple of days. I have too. Our uh, dry runs have gone great. I've learned a lot, so hopefully you guys will too. Speaking of learning, um, there's a couple great ways to stay involved in the live stream throughout the show. So you can be commenting on the chats on the side. I'll be monitoring that and answering questions as well as the uh, microchip at live stream or live stream at microchip.com. One of these days, I'm yep. going to get that right You'll the first right. time. Um, you can ask us some great questions on there as well. We'll be monitoring that email feed as well. Um, last thing is, if you stay tuned, we'll be announcing a uh, kind of a general gift for everyone involved uh, that watches that. We'll be announcing that at the end. Ooh, so that's, make that's sure you pretty stick exciting. Around. Good teaser. Yep, yep, absolutely. I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's going to be good. Everyone's going to be excited. Yeah, and I actually, I uh, want to make sure that I, I've always wanted to do this. Subscribe. There's oh, yes. Subscribe. Yep, make absolutely. Make sure you subscribe, hit notifications, because we do this on a fairly regular basis. Yeah, and that will continue to, uh, yeah. We love doing these things, so hopefully more to come. But Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what we got today? Absolutely. So uh, before we begin, though, uh, Daniel, uh, yes. again, welcome. Uh, Thank it's you. It's nice having you here. Uh, can you tell our viewers uh, basically what you do here at Microchip? All right. Uh, so my name is Daniel Ho. Mm -hmm. uh, I work as a technical marketing engineer as a MCO8 division, which means I mainly work with uh, our 8-bit products, including PIC and AVR right. devices. And what I do is to like develop content or demos online uh, for tutorials for our users to be like easier for them to use our products. Awesome. And and just um, in a previous life too, you were actually in our applications group. Yes. And you and I imagine you in your previous role you came across our analog peripherals quite a bit. Yeah, I've gained some experience like awesome. developing. Yeah. So everyone, this is your opportunity to ask a, a great question if, if it relates to the analog uh, world. We'll try and answer it if we can't. Uh, we have people who are answering questions uh, inside of the uh, the chat window. Um, and if, if still we can't answer your question, still post the question and we'll make sure that uh, you do get an answer to that. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about analog signals and how to read them inside of a microcontroller. And uh, here's the problem, right? We all live in an analog world. Microcontrollers deal with things in ones and zeros if you boil it right down. So how do we take that analog signal and make it make sense or speak the language of a microcontroller? Um, and we're going to cover this with basically uh, four key points. Uh, we're going to talk about four things that you can do to make analog acquisition easy or easier. Uh, and we're going to talk ab about figuring out how to get the signal into the digital domain. So converting that analog signal into, into this uh, digital world. Uh, we're going to also talk about mitigating noisy signals. So how do we get rid of some of that noise or, or accommodate for some of that noise so we can actually read the signal accurately. We're also going to talk about the third point, which is maximizing the accuracy of your system. And finally, we're going to talk about uh, reducing total system costs. Um, so to begin with, uh, Daniel, there, there's all kinds of diff different uh, analog signals that we can deal with on an on a application. Yeah, can so you're absolutely right. So can you give us some examples of that? Or? Yeah, so uh, there, as you just said, there are all kinds of analog signals that we deal with in the real world. There are analog signals coming from the wall, which mm -hmm. is like AC signals. Of course, yeah. And there are like 
regular analog signals are coming from zero volts to maybe five volts, mm -hmm. which is matching our uh, MCU's um, power supply. And uh, there are other um, signals that's kind of vague, so you need to actually amplify it using maybe an op amp. Right. So, so and this could be anything from temperature to reading the light levels in a room yes. to the humidity and mm -hmm. so on. Right. Uh, in fact, we actually have an example today yeah. that we're going to demonstrate, and we'll walk through. Uh, after we cover these four points, we'll kind of show, um, show this in action. Um, so uh, it, with all these different types of signals out there, uh, the, the microcontroller essentially speaks one ones language. And it's ones and zeros. But exactly. it also, if you want to add a dialect to it, mm -hmm. uh, it also speaks mainly voltage levels. Right. right? Um, so, can we talk about some of the some of the capabilities that we have on our 8-bit PIC and AVRs that actually mm -hmm. make it easier for you to take that analog world and translate it to the microcontroller? Domain? Yeah, I actually have a, a I have a slides ready. So, if you guys can switch to my screen, so these are all the uh, peripherals and uh, functionalities available in our uh, PIC and AVR devices. Okay. I mean 8-bit, and uh, as you can see, it's been categorized based on different colors, based and, on its functionalities. And, and just a note here that, that this, you're not going to get a microcontroller with all of these on it at yes. the same time. These uh, we are sell, the functions we are, are available, but uh, we have different devices that's specialized in different areas, different functionalities. So different combinations of these peripherals. And that's, yes. that's why we offer so many products, is to kind of give the customer the opportunity to, to choose something that's going to fit their application. Right. OK, cool. And uh, so since today, we're going to talk about the analog to digital world. So mm -hmm. I figure we're probably going to focus on the uh, intelligent analog part, okay. which includes ADC, A, A to D converter. Um, we have all kinds of ADCs. We, ha we have advanced ADCs, which has a gain stake. We have ADCs with computation. We call it ADC squared. Uh, we also have comparators, high-speed comparators. We have DAC, which is digital to analog converter. We have uh, op amps embedded in our MCU, right? And 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 I think um, um, you know if you take a look at these analog peripherals, it's important to understand that um, on these devices, these analog peripherals aren't digital uh, digital entities being made to act like an analog peripheral. This is yes. an analog peripheral from the design stage up. Right. Correct. Okay. It's like uh, if you're doing a design and you have external components like op amps and ADCs, we, we do actually make some of the external components. But with our intelligent analog MCU, you can act it's actually embedded inside the MCU. Right. So this, and we'll talk about this later, where it goes a long way in, in not only reducing the bomb cost of your application, but, but more importantly, it reduces um, layout complexity and so on. Yes. Um, so. So we have things on there like a comparator, an analog to digital converter. Uh, can you kind of, you know, for, for viewers who really aren't familiar with how you use these various peripherals, can you talk a little bit about the difference? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, as we know, we have analog to digital converter. We also have comparators. So that might be a main um, confusion by people. Like people may think that if I, u if I have an ADC, why do I need a comparator? Because right. if you think about it, comparator is just one bit ADC. It goes to low and high. And uh, so the, the difference, the main difference is the processing speed. So right. the comparator has a higher response speed and doesn't involve your CPU to, to do the conversion right, like, right. like you need to do with ADC. So there is some benefits using the comparators. Okay. Um, I think there's a question in the booth. Hey, Mark. Yeah, thank you so much. We got a couple great questions here. Uh, the first one is, does MPLAB Express have any special functions specifically for analog signal processing? Um, I think you guys kind of briefly touched on that when you were talking earlier, but just to answer that question for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the MPLAB Express IDE is uh, plugged in with the MPLAB code configurator, right. which we call the MCC. And the MCC actually has functionalities to configure your intelligent analog module for you. Right, and, and I think um, you know, the, uh, the code configurator team has done a great job with taking these, and some of these peripherals are, are, are relatively advanced in the fact that they have a lot of capabilities to them. And this, 
graphical interface inside of the code configurator really makes it easy to set up these peripherals and, and route the signals. And an yeah. important point with these peripherals too, Daniel, is that um, with them integrated onto the chip, you get a couple advantages from that. First mm -hmm. of all, you can run the signals uh, between Inside the various the peripherals. Yes. And you can do anything from relatively simple interconnections to, right. to advanced, uh, more, a little more elaborate yes, configurations. Yes, like with uh, several peripherals together, you can make a combination and then make up a, a more advanced peripheral yourself, right. and customized. And, and to the point where, where a lot of times these peripherals can operate independent of the central processing. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know, you'll hear a lot of times these peripherals referred to as intelligent analog. And what that basically means is that the, this analog has the ability to be changed dynamically on the fly during the, during the execution of your application, depending on system changes. Yes. Um, and that's important. I mean, if you're, if you're designing an application, a lot of times you have to, you have to accommodate for worst case scenarios. Right. And if you don't have this intelligence uh, on your device, mm -hmm. uh, and you're using all these external components. Yes, um, and it also adds a flexibility to your system. Right. Uh, like for example, if you have a design that you need two comparators externally, and then you need to build up your uh, layout for two comparators, now you have your MCU with two comparators or one comparator with different channels, and you can just switch channels to use this internal comparator. Right, uh, that's a great point, great point. Um, okay, so, so, to, so that's point one, uh, which is figure out how to get the signal into the digital domain. So obviously we have uh, all these peripherals that are on the, um, on the microcontroller, and this makes it a lot easier for you to kind of not only convert these signals, but then route them throughout the system and then deal with it, you know, uh, dynamically. The next point, uh, and if you're dealing with analog signals, especially analog signals that are in a mixed application, and by mixed I mean there's a digital component to it, and then there's an analog component to it, a lot of times you're going to be dealing and with noise. Yes, it basically happens to every uh, system you design, like there's going to be analog part, there's going to be digital part. Right. And, and I mean, you've, you've done in the past many motor control applications, yes. and I'm sure you've had to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, you well, have basically a basically, if you have a motor running beside you, you have a big inductor. Right. And uh, your signal is going to be noisy. Your feedback, your, uh, even your uh, ADC readings and everything is going to be noisy. And, and this noise can go anywhere from something that's periodic to uh, something that is just random. random. And, and, and in fact, before we started this live stream, we were kind of having a conversation about the application that Daniel yes. was using. And can you so, tell uh, me a little bit about yeah. the issue you had? Actually, I was uh, trying to make my demo work. And uh, remember the, uh, the power supply you lent me the yeah. other day? So I was using that uh, for, for the 5 volt power supply. And then instead of using it from the, from the laptop. Right. And then this power supply turns out, be, uh, turns out to be really noisy. And I couldn't get the signal right. Like, the whole time. So, so why was the power supply noisy? For, for well, uh, it I depends mean, on how level. they design it, right? And it depends on where whether it has a static ground. Okay. Sometimes it just have two headers, and then it's kind of floating. And you know, in, in other instances, uh, if you're using um, a, some sort of digital device somewhere in the system, I mean, you're dealing with with very fast rise times on logic, right. and that creates a noisy world. Um, oscillators. Yeah. And if you're using anything like a microcontroller, you most microcontroller has an oscillator. And right. if it doesn't, you need an external one. But yes, um, and that could be a very noisy situation. So, what do we do about that? So, oh, there are several things we can do. Uh, we can do a low-pass filtering on it. Mm -hmm. If we don't have a low-pass filter, and what does a low-pass filter do for anyone who doesn't know? Well, the, uh, on a higher level, the low-pass filter just filtering out the higher frequency components in your signal. Which, might, which means, uh, means noise. Noise, right. yes. OK. And so uh, a simple way to do the low pass filtering is actually just averaging. And we do have an app note talking about how to deal with the noise using the average mode in our advanced ADC in the AVR, AVR devices. OK. And, and what Daniel's referring to is a new product uh, recently that came out um, in AVR, uh, AT Mega 4809. And yes. this, this device has a really cool analog to digital converter on it. Um, and what we'll do is uh, 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 the applications engineers wrote a really good app note um, um, 
talking about noise countermeasures. And uh, mm -hmm. what we'll do is we'll reference that in the uh, comments section below. Yes. And that is actually taking a lot of uh, samples and doing averaging once at a time. And then you kind of get rid of the noise. And by so by averaging, that. what we're doing is we're just taking a lot of reads on that pin. Yes. We're adding them together to right. get a larger number. And then we do it. Divide it by the number of times we actually read it. It's, yes. it's basic averaging, but mm -hmm. we're doing that inside of. Before we did that in software. Well, then it's going to be a lot of time for the CPU to react. Because uh, you know, uh, if the CPU is going to do a divide, it's going to do it in software. And it's going to eat up a lot of uh, time of your uh, CPU. And, and these new analog to digital converters that, that we're working with, so on the 4809, Newer uh, PIC products like the one you're using here, yes. uh, they, they integrate this ability to average automatically in hardware without you having to do that in software. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very cool. Um, some, other, some other things that we need to worry about with, um, with, with noise or uh, other things that actually help with noise, um, what about a lot of these 8-bit products can run at 5 volts. What does right. that mean to the noisy? application so actually that means a lot like um, for example the, the demo I'm working on is using a, a micro uh, I'm sorry microwave uh, sensor which okay. runs at 5 volt so actually you if you need to measure the signal you actually need a uh, MCU that operates at 5 volt and why they designed their sensors to be 0 to 5 volts is because it gives you a, a better bandwidth to the noise because you have a, a, a larger range. There's, there's a, a, a larger yeah, range. Larger range. If you're operating at, you know, uh, down or 2 volts yeah. or whatever, you've got a lot more. Okay, very cool. Um, okay, so, uh, and of course, you know, operating at 5 volts, it's like anything. If, if um, it, you're going to be balancing power consumption with with, of course, this, this noise filtering mm -hmm. capability. Um, OK, so point number three. Uh, so that's point number two. So next <laughs> point is point number three. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is just maximizing the accuracy of your system. Um, now, Daniel, this particular application is mm -hmm. going to demonstrate sampling. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? What does sampling mean? So. Uh what the sampling means is that, so if you're taking, for example, you're using ADC to take your voltage. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually when you design an application or a design, you're going to deal with the, the voltage with something, right? Okay. You're going to form up a, a system. Maybe in a control loop, you're going to use the voltage as a feedback. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, you're doing a filtering after the voltage, after you're reading the voltage. And all, it, it all needs a fixed sampling rate. Okay. That, that's when you get your uh, voltage from your continuous system to your digital system. And in order to make that digital system right, you need to have a fixed sampling rate. And that's really essential when you are doing things like signal processing. And that just means you're going you're gonna to consistently read the signal. Yes. At a, at so exactly I'm going to read one sample, and then I'm going to wait for a fixed amount of time. A fixed amount of time every time. Another. Yes. And that gives you a more accurate view. Your system, I, I mean, this machine, the microcontroller, is getting ones and zeros back at the end of this. I mean, yes. an analog signal is going into an analog to digital converter, which is mm -hmm. changing that into ones and zeros. Yeah. And it gives it a more accurate right. representation of what that signal especially if it's changing over time. Yes. OK, cool. And gives you a, a more stable frequency response. And these new peripherals, these new analog to digital converters, um, feature the ability to make that part of it a lot easier. Yes. because. If you think about it, if you want to do it in software before, and then what you do is you do an ADC conversion, and then you do a software delay, for mm -hmm. example. And the software delay is going to give you a fixed amount of time of delay. But uh, how about your routines before that? Right. So it's, for example, I'm reading an ADC value of, um, let's say, 0. And uh, you're going to take the 0 in. And if you're going to read some other values that's bigger, it's going to take different times for the CPU to process. And that different time, you, can, you cannot really control that. But we fixed that. Yes, because we have the advanced ADC with the auto-triggering, which you can actually use a timer, a hardware timer, to trigger the ADC conversion. So you can have the timer connected to the A to D, yes. and then at the timer, at a certain point, we'll just goes and trigger boom, boom, boom. the A to D to read, and software doesn't have to be involved. Yes. Very cool. Uh, I think we have a question in the booth. 
Hey, yeah, Mark and Daniel, this may be more for you, but um, the PIC and AVR chips, do we use flash ADC or successive approximation type ADC, or is that per chip or? So it's, a, it's an interesting question on the type of converters we use for, for, the, for, the, piece, for, the, uh, for the PICs and the AVRs we're talking about here. Yeah, I think for the most part, um, we use successive approximation A to Ds. Um, but again, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's what we, I think that's mostly what we use. Um, but again, we can elaborate in the comments section later. Yes. Um, we'll find out for sure. But, okay? Yeah. And one other question, um, choosing the clocks, so if you choose the clocks to work at the highest possible clock rate, how is that going to affect the analog readings, meaning the internal digital circuits and how will that influence them on the analog side? Okay, so if you choose a really high uh, oscillator frequency, then it's, it doesn't mean that your ADC is gonna run that fast if you choose the oscillator clock to be your ADC clock, because your ADC has a max, maximum, um, we call it the TAD, TAD, mm -hmm. which is the conversion time. Okay. So you're, you have a, a minimum conversion time that the ADC can achieve that based on how we design the ADC, what the speed of the ADC is, mm -hmm. and uh, it's basically the, the fastest you can go with the ADC. Okay. And, and, and there's lots of things you have to consider, um, I, I mean, on the, uh, on the input of an analog to digital converter there's a capacitance yes and uh, you need to charge and discharge the capacitance right. and you need to you need enough time for it so you have to pay attention to that and and that is going to all depend how fast that capacitor charges is the impedance of the system that you're plugging into it and so on yes um, yeah and uh, as always there's um, at the end of every data sheet there is an electrical specifications area and a lot of this information is available there and it'll explain you know the boundaries in which you you have to have to play. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, so just to, just to, to move it along a little bit um, now, uh, and of course, all of this has to do with core independent peripherals, which means this peripheral is able to do a lot of tasks that were traditionally done in software. So, ex yes. for example, the the averaging that Daniel talked about, mm -hmm. low pass filtering. Um, the, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about thresholds when we do the application, but uh, ultimately this means that a, a central processing unit on a microcontroller that is traditionally can only do one task at a time. Yes. Can multitask, right. truly multitask with the peripheral handling yeah, a so task and then the CPU doing something else. Right, the CPU has only one core, so right. it does things sequentially. And uh, if you want to, say, uh, do a signal conditioning and you have to capture a rising edge, if you do it in your uh, main loop, you're going to sometimes miss a glitch. Right. And if you use uh, the hardware, then you're not going to miss it. Okay. Uh, and just uh, so, just to move on, uh, the, the last point in our four points here is to reduce total system costs. Now, uh, now, of course, we're talking a bomb, you know, which is yes. bill of materials. Um, so what makes up your application? Um, and this is components, and obviously if you, if you uh, integrate these components onto the chip, so I mean some of these chips have op amps on them and so on, yeah. uh, it's going to reduce your component size, or right. your, your component count, but... Yeah, it's kind of obvious that it saves space for your layout, and that's, it saves bomb. That's also where you're saving money, is yes. just on the layout itself, I mm -hmm. mean the complexity that gets reduced from that. Right, and uh, you're actually saving your engineering time developing those exactly. circuits and uh, even writing your code. And if you write a code, sometimes you got a bug. Right. I, I don't know about you, but I got bugs all the Abs time. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the other thing too is just if you, if, you're, if you have to accommodate for a rather large circuit, I mean, you're, you're laying out a bunch of traces to, to connect this guy to this guy, this capacitor to this, this op amp or to whatever. Yes. Um, the more layout complexity you have, uh, the more traces on your circuit board. I mean, every time you add a trace to that circuit board, you're adding noise you're the potential for noise i mean yeah. you're adding either if it's a trace you're adding either a resistor a capacitor an inductor or maybe even an antenna mm -hmm. um, and then of course you have to accommodate for all that with your bench testing so that's time and this kind of saves you time yeah exactly okay um so so those are kind of the four points and we'll, re we'll revisit those at the end just to kind of remind you about those uh but daniel 
let's let's talk a little bit about this application that you created. Okay. Um, just to kind of kind of drive home some of these core concepts. So this application is pretty simple. Uh, let me uh, unplug these probes so I can lift it up. So as you can see, I have what I have is three things: one breadboard, mm -hmm. uh, one express board, which is the PIC 16F 1A446. Okay. This is our the, one of our price. And I that's this today. board here. Yes. And I'm using a microelectronica uh, click, which is microwave click. Okay. It and detects that's a microwave with a panel. All right. Yes. And now, so, and just a note about these microelectronica clicks, um, the whole goal um, with these is just to have a, a board, and you may have watched previous live streams and we've talked a lot about them, but just to refresh your memory, yes. the goal with this is to have a piece of hardware already made that it's going to interface with your microcontroller, which is on this board here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and so you don't have to build yeah, it yourself. Yeah, it's pretty convenient to do some uh, prototyping right. job. I mean, yeah. uh, honestly, this this whole application, other than yeah. three, uh, so wires, I have three wires, and yeah. uh, one wire is connected to the analog pin, mm -hmm. of the, which is the output of the click, and two are the power and ground, and that's it. And just a word on this board here, the express board. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we're not we're not connected to a programmer debugger per se, external, yeah. because that's actually integrated onto the onto the board. Right, and so, we call it drag and drop process, right. where yeah. you have a text file or you have a file that created by your uh, Express IDE, and you can just drop the, uh, tra track the file and drop it under the disk. So if you're using MP Lab X, which is our main, uh, uh, one of our main uh, integrated development environments, um, you're gonna write code in that uh, environment and it's going to generate what's called a hex file and what Daniel's saying here is when you plug this board into the computer it's going to look kind of like a flash drive and you can just drag and drop that hex file onto the the flash drive and it programs your board for you yes okay so so let's let's take a look uh, so so w what exactly is this application intended to do so it is, it is a motion detector. Okay. So it's like, uh, so microwave uh, sensor is used for a lot of motion detection. Okay. Like when you walk into the room and the lights just. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a question in the booth. Hey, yeah, Mark. Uh, just wanted to stop you real fast because we actually did get a really good question. Um, and just a shout out to Radix. There are no dumb questions. I hope I'm saying that right. But uh, I think you actually asked a really great question. And that is, um, is there any products that have something similar to like an op amp or a comparator? But essentially what you're doing is making a bunch of logic gates that you can connect between them and do different things with them. Yeah, so this plays right into the strengths of all of our products. Yeah, yes. for sure. So it's, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so I would say every product with the op amps and comparators are capable of using a logic connection which we call uh, a config board logic cell, CLC, the, or uh, on the on the PIC devices, yes, yeah, and the CCL, which is config board uh, custom, custom logic custom on logic. the AVRs. Yeah, yeah. I'm always, yeah, I can forget those things. Oh no, yeah. that's cool. There's a lot of acronyms, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna we're gonna try and make sure that you guys uh, all hear what the acronyms actually mean. <laughs> that's yes. right. Even even we sometimes uh, yeah forget them. <laughs> yeah. There's even an acronym for acronyms. It's yes. called TLA three letter acronym. And it's, <laughs> Well, or FLA, it, but, but we don't want to talk about that. But anyway. Yeah, and it's a, it's a peripheral that's uh, mainly used for like internal connection and logic, sequential logic, combination logic. And, and the, the configurable logic cell on the PIC uh, is a series of gates. Um, there's sequential logic on it, like uh, SR latches and D latches. Mm -hmm. And you can essentially take uh, signals within the system from both digital and analog peripherals apply logic to them, and then run them to another peripheral, maybe another analog peripheral. On the, uh, on the AVRs, the custom configurable logic, is, it's, it's a really cool feature where it's, it's, uh, it's actually a lookup table at the yes. front end, um, and I'm, then you can apply uh, sequential logic to it if you want. You can run many signals within the microcontroller to that, and then out, and it's, uh, they're just... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they seem like very basic peripherals, but they're, if, if you look at them in some of the app notes that are out there, they're extremely powerful, so powerful app notes. Yeah. Yes. Maybe we could use this as a you know, topic for another, another I think this would be a great live stream just to talk 
talk the logic on these devices. Yes. Well, uh, pay attention out there because we'll uh, bring a live stream to a computer near you in the not too distant future. Or phone. Or phone. Or television. Or tablet. For, for us older gentlemen television. and ladies who like to watch things on 3D television. 3D virtual environment someday. You never know. Yes, yeah. that's true. I only have radios in my house. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, Daniel, we... Uh, Podcast. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're talking about this uh, microwave click, mm -hmm. which is going to detect motion. Let's, yes. let's, so let's, let's see how this let's works. Let's take a look like how, how the signal looks like first, right? Uh, well, uh, you know, even before we do that, why don't we, why don't we show it in action? So, yeah. so, so basically what you have... Um, so I have a scope connected to the board, okay. as you can see in my screen. And uh, this is demonstrating how there is no motion, okay. how, how there is, uh, the signal looks like. And now so if I you can see it's kind of a little bit of waveform there, but not not so much. And it's if flat. I put my hand over it, and there you go, you got you go the motion. See that that. Yes. So so the application you've got the microcontroller reading that signal, mm -hmm. and you're outputting to uh, a, a terminal window. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, can you open that for a sec and let's sure. have a look? So so I have so I'll explain these three uh, variables later. Okay. But you, as you can see, if I move my uh, finger close to, so if there's a movement, it's going to give me an alert. And only when there's movement, it gives you an alert. So yes. otherwise, it's just sitting there. And mm -hmm. if it's just sitting there, that means the microcontroller can actually go into sleep mode or, exactly. or whatever. If this is a battery application, sleep right. mode is, is just a very low power mode that consumes very little yes. current. Yes. So if you have a battery application, that's good for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how did you make this happen? So as you can see, if you uh, move this, it's kind of like it's non-periodic. Right. It's, it's kind of random. So, so um, this is not something I made up for the algorithm. Actually, I checked up online for their Microelectronica um, and, and website. Microelectronica so has open it up. code examples on all these boards. Yes. So this is the uh, website. If you so go you to can Daniel's switch my screen, screen. Guys. this is a website for the uh, microwave click. And it, as you can see, it has an introduction. It has an introduction video, which is kind of funny. And uh, it has a um, schematic and everything. It tells you the, how the uh, microwave click works. And if I scroll down, there is a, like a pseudocode okay. that does actually the detection. And what this code does is something like it's taking several samples and doing an average. So I, I can show you guys how it works uh, by using this slice. So basically, I divide my code based on what they told me on the Microelectronica website. Okay. Uh, this is on, on the upper half of the slide is the signal with no motion, and okay. there's a signal with motion. And what we do is we sample the no motion. We call it a calibration phase, where there's no motion. We sample some samples, and then um, we do a, a little bit of averaging, and we call that a reference. Okay. So as you can see, when there's motion, then there's going to be uh, samples be, uh, below the reference, and there's going to be samples above the reference. So the, so the reference you obtained by taking some A to D reads yes. of the signal, exactly. and, then, and then determining that baseline, mm -hmm. this is no motion, this is yes. what the value should be. Yes, okay. and that's before all the main loop. Okay. And then we can take either, I mean, the below half or the above ha half of the uh, samples. Okay. And we say, if your sample is higher than your reference, we're going to take that sample as a count. Okay. And then if we calculate that, the average of those samples is going to be sitting around there. Okay. And then we're setting up a threshold saying, okay, if your average value is larger than the threshold we set, I mean, the average uh, minus the reference is larger than the threshold we set. We call it a, a motion, and that's it. That's and, basically how we detect it. And in software is usually the way this is done, and yes. that's, that could be, I mean. And that, I'm, I'm showing this for the tasks for the MCU to do with it. So on a basic analog to digital converter that doesn't have this core independent capabilities that yes. we're going to talk about, this is what you would have to do in right. software. Right, and okay. you need to do an ADC conversion routine. And you need to um, uh, you need to determine if the ADC result is uh, bigger than the reference, and then do accumulation. And there you need to do so in order to calculate the average, you need to do a divide. Right. And that divide is going to take you some time. 
Right, and 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 like uh, some of the peripherals uh, you'll take a look at, especially the math-based peripherals. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so we have another peripheral called the the math accumulator. Uh, but you'll see, um, you know, does this save me a lot of code? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not. Right. On the surface, maybe if you're writing in C, you're going to still see one line of code that does the divide or one line of code that does something, but in the background, mm -hmm. if you look under the hood yes. and you see what's actually being generated to make that high level function work, yes. you can look at the assembly code and, yeah. and all of our IDEs allow you to do this. Exactly, and I mean, essentially it's the CPU who, who does the job, right. who runs the code, so you're actually saving your code for your CPU. And how would, you, you how would you divide? Usually it's a bit shift, right? Yeah, it's a it's a multiplier with some bit shifts. That's how that's how you divide with uh, in, uh, within the uh, software. And 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 that's one of the capabilities that you can actually um, add into hardware. And that's what we did with the analog to digital converter with computation mm -hmm. peripheral. That actually allows you to shift bits a certain amount to get a divide. Yeah, and it's automatic. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, after talking about all these tasks for and the MCU. Uh, so this is basically how we uh, develop this using a, so a software-based ADC, which is basic ADC. So it's just so the flowchart of your code. Yes, that you I'm not to gonna do. go into this. No, it's but yeah, but you can notice there. I, I put some clocks uh, in some blocks. Okay. That means that these routines are actually taking some time. Like you are doing the ADC conversion, where we need to wait for the going down bit mm -hmm. to be set to uh, to make sure that the conversion is done. There is time you take for the divide. There's time of the delay that we talked about, the fixed delay that you add. That's not even going to be accurate for your sampling right. frequency. OK. So let's take a look at these. So this is me using the uh, ADC squared, which is ADC with computation, mm -hmm. our new ADC, which is available in this device, the PIC 16F18446. And, and, and just just for viewers, the the um, the the new A to D on the AT Mega forty eight oh nine. And it's also capable of doing which is that. an AVR product has has compatible capabilities yes, with this. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, as you can see now, my in my firmware, all I can all I need to do is to wait for this ADC interrupt, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna send the V alert, basically print out something to the terminal, and that's everything I need to do in the firmware. Okay. Yes. And so, and so this interrupt is going to happen when? It's going to happen whenever there's a threshold met uh, after, I mean, after certain ADCC average measurement. Okay. Yes. All right. So, 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 so now, um, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, and we're going to, uh, we'll talk about this yes. later. Go ahead. So, and so we can, we can take a look at the uh, ADCC, which, uh, or ADC squared. So it has several advanced functions like auto triggering, which you can use a timer to uh, as a trigger source. Or and that's your or sampling rate you were yeah, talking Yeah, or about. anything else, like an external signal even. And it has averaging, accumulation, special comparison, which, we, which all these three functions are being used in, in my demo. And it also has a, a digital low pass filter. OK. Yes. So after that, um, let's walk step by step sure. how, how we, yeah. uh, how we have this combination of peripherals that does the, the, the job for you. So first of all is the comparator with the DAC, which the DAC is actually setting my reference. So remember right. we have a calibration phase, we measure the reference, mm -hmm. then I'm putting the reference into the DAC, so the comparator is actually comparing with the DAC. So, so with, this, with this DAC, now uh, some people may uh, have a perception of what a DAC, which is a digital to analog converter, mm -hmm. does. Yes. Um, now, um, can you explain how we traditionally use these on these devices? So um, basically, if people think of uh, a DAC, that means uh, you're outputting a voltage mm -hmm. to a pin, and yep. that's all you can do. But actually, uh, our DAC's uh, really useful in internal connections, where you can set your reference, like what I did for this demo that you can set the reference for your comparator for something else that you can compare it with. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really giving you uh, flexibility to using your other, other uh, peripherals. And, and this just gives you a, a very fine resolution 
Um, so is this a 5-bit deck on yeah, here? Yeah, it's a 5-bit So deck. if it's a 5-bit deck, you can think uh, 2 to the power of 5. Yes. Uh, different voltage levels. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to have is you're going to have is the fundamental voltage is a reference voltage. Right. And this could be, uh, uh, you know, Anything. an off-chip voltage reference. We mm -hmm. have some great on-chip voltage references. Yes. In fact, we have... We have uh, a fixed uh, voltage reference. And why is that important, a fixed voltage reference? So if you think about if you're doing a design and you're uh, using your power supply to supply power to your um, MCU, and maybe it's running out of a, a battery, and you think you might be outputting 3.3 volts to your, or 5 volts to your uh, uh, MCU, but you might not be because the battery is going to run out and the voltage is going to drop. It may be drifting. Yes, and it may be drifting. And if you have a fixed design, uh, I mean fixed voltage reference in your MCU, you, you can use that to measure your VDD and that's to gonna, monitor. And that's going to remain very constant yes, regardless of the VDD drift, exactly. or and VDD being yeah. the supply voltage yeah. to the And if you, have, you, if you need accurate measurement of your ADC, then you can use that fixed voltage reference to be your ADC reference. And in fact, it's so stable that there's actually um, app notes out there on how to use the voltage reference in an A to D to check when your battery is failing on your system. Yes. Or failing, but I mean starting to drain on your system. Exactly. Okay. And so, so basically what the DAC does is just it subdivides that voltage reference down so that you can be a little more granular with yeah. what you put on the reference. Okay. Yes. Cool. So I'm setting the DAC to be the reference so that Basically, these combination of peripherals are doing the logic job for if the ADC result is bigger than reference for me. And then, if my comparator output is high, which means our, my voltage is higher than the reference, then I'm using this timer 2. Note that I put timer 2 instead of timer 1 or timer 0, because actually for this device, the timer 2 for 6 is what we call the hardware limit timer, which can do an other trigger uh, re uh, I mean, uh, not auto tri external trigger resource, which I can use the comparator as an exter external trigger resource. So, so uh, basically, and this is part of that interconnection we talked about, the yes. comparator is turning the timer on or right. off. So yes. it doesn't just interconnect with other analog peripherals, mm -hmm. you're running a timer with it. Yes. And Very cool. So what it does is whenever the comparator turns high, it's going to have the timer starts outputting, which is generating a clock. Right. And I'm using the clock as the uh, auto trigger source for the uh, ADC squared. OK, so when, when, when that comparator detects that that reference, which indicates no motion, mm -hmm. has gone so above the that above reference. The reference, then I'm, ta I'm, as soon as I'm you taking get motion, no samples. Yes. You're not taking any samples unless that goes above. Yes. And that is fundamental logic that you had to do in software before right. that is now being done automatically for you. Exactly. And the CPU at this point is still not even involved in this. Yes. Other than initializing everything. Right. And and honestly all of this stuff is, is very easily configurable in, inside of the code configurator mm -hmm. which shows it graphically or if you're using an AVR, yes. uh, this start is, right. is the version for the AVR which mm -hmm. is another great tool. Yes. Uh, similar in the graphical programming nature. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so by using this topology, I'm only sampling the ADC while there's voltage above my reference. Okay. And I'm taking those voltages and then do the average using using the average mode in my ADC squared. Okay. And that takes care of the average, and then it also has a special comparison. So I'm using a special comparison with the average mode to create an output whenever there's uh, a voltage, I mean, an uh, average voltage exists the uh, threshold. OK. And that's, that's pretty much that's uh, the application. how we do it, yes. Now, um, um, so as far as what this looks like in MCC, mm -hmm. would you have MCC open? Or? Yes, yeah. I actually does. OK, so again, MCC is the uh, MPLAB code configurator. Let's, let's just take a look at what this application would look like to the user all inside right. of this. So I have my MCC opened up. And as you can see, all I have on the left top side is my comparator, which is brought to the project. And essentially, all, the, all you're doing with the comparator is you're just choosing. Yes, I'm choosing the DAC as the positive uh, reference. 
and I'm inverting it because I, I want uh, whenever the DAC references, uh, whenever the voltage is higher than the DAC reference, uh, I kind of invert okay. the uh, comparator. All right. That's how I did. And then I have the DAC, which is set as normal. Okay. So and, and again, you're showing uh, in the drop down for the, um, the reference voltage. So right now you're using uh, VDD and VSS, which yes. is nomenclature used for our PIC devices. Right. VDD meaning the positive supply voltage, VSS, you can, you can pretty much ground. think of as ground-ish. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But uh, can you show some of the options under VD, uh, under those references? Yes. So as we talked about the fixed voltage reference, okay. it actually can have uh, your fixed voltage, re voltage reference buffer as your uh, positive reference. Okay. Yes. And then there's also VREF plus, which is just a pin? Yes. So VREF plus is a pin, and VREF minus is also a pin. So you can actually use two pins to, to make the reference of the DAC. And, and again, you're just using drop-down menus here to configure this. So I yes. mean, the data sheet is your friend, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, honestly, at a high level, you can get a pretty good idea from the co-configurator and start how these peripherals actually behave. So if you wanted yeah. to take out uh, a new microcontroller, and we do have samples available, so if you mm -hmm. wanted to sample a microcontroller and try it out, and it has a peripheral on there that maybe you're not 100% familiar with, yeah. the co-configurator is a great way to, to kind of take this thing and, and at a very high level use it, and it's going to generate a code example or yes. a, a functions in the background for you to use if you need to make changes at runtime. Yes, um, and I mean, I'm, I'm just showing you guys how I deal with the DAC. Right. My, I mean, it's a, it's a relatively uh, simple peripheral. What if I'm showing you guys to uh, how to uh, configure the timer too, which is hardware limit timer. And you can see I have a, a drag down menu of a, a lot of options okay. here. So imagine how you're going to do it by setting up the register. Then it's going to be a, a lot of pain. One of the things I like about the code configurator is, is like if you take a look at the timer period, um, it, yes, it actually it, tells you where, what are your constraints on that depending on your, on your setup. Now, yes. can you show them quickly, like if you wanted to change that from five milliseconds to say, you decided that four milliseconds is yeah. better. So what kind, normally so, if you were to go into the data sheet, you'd have to do some calculations. What right. do you do here? So I do backspace and then four. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty okay. much uh, what That's I pretty to much tell it. you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and depends on the, the range of your timer period, you can uh, set the uh, prescaler, postscaler, your clock source to change that. Okay. Yes. Now, before we run out of time, uh, just can you show quickly the, uh, the A to D? Yeah. I know you want to see that. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, up top, you have the various modes of operation. Mm -hmm. um, and you can still use this in basic mode. If you want to run a... Um, yeah. A one at a time analog to digital read, um, you can do that. Yes. But we're using it in more of its um, mm -hmm. function rich, we'll right. call it, mode. And as you can see, I'm setting up the auto conversion trigger as timer two. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you may notice that under these uh, computation, f computation features, uh, which I, I didn't really set at the initialization phase because I'm going to change it. Afterwards, right, because you right? have to read your reference anyway. Yes, exactly. At, at, okay. And I can I can easily use that. So if I open up my code, so a MCC doesn't uh, only generate all the initialization code for you. It also has some useful functions that uh, give you a flexibility to run it uh, during runtime. Okay. Like I'm setting, I'm just using some functions like these. These functions are all generated by MCC, I didn't need to write those. And by the way, everyone, this is the intelligence part of your analog. So remember we talked about designing these applications for worst case scenarios. Well, if you have a system that doesn't have intelligence, that's kind of what you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but in this situation here, because all these great functions have been generated in the background for you, yes, the system can react to this. So if you mm -hmm. need to make tweaks to the DAC, tweaks to the analog to digital converter. You could even change completely how the analog to digital converter is yeah. working. Yeah. Um, you can do that all in, in, inside yeah. a software, if and you now can, you have a dynamically responsive system. Right, and if you can see my code, uh, I have like changing the, uh, the DAC 
output, I'm changing even the interrupt service routine of that. Uh, I'm switching the service routine of my uh, ADCC interrupt right. to do some different tasks during runtime, and it's all provided by MCC. Cool. And again, if you're not familiar with programming, if you're if you're traditionally an analog person, um, or if you're you're new to all of this for the first time, this code is a great reference too. I mean, if you go into like some of the functions that yeah. have been created, or if you even look at the initialization, essentially you're writing like hexadecimal values into a register mm -hmm. in the backgrounds. Can you zoom in on the on the code a little bit, Daniel? Uh, I'm not sure how do I do Okay, that. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Okay. All right, so yeah. um, and now. And as you can see in my code, this all this all I need to write, and uh, in my main loop, I I, I didn't do anything. Right. <laughs> Which means, the central processing unit is free to do something else. Yes. Okay. Um, one last thing, Daniel. Can you just show the pin manager? Just um, okay. Um, and and uh, you know we've talked about this in previous. Uh, I wish I could uh, zoom in. Uh, there's a way to do it. We're just uh, it's lost on us at the moment. But uh, essentially, what, what what the pin manager is showing, you'll see there's a lot of little blue boxes on there. And what that mm -hmm. means is, and they're they're like little unlock things. And and what yes. that means is the peripherals on this device uh, uh, ha is going to have signals, and you can tie those individual signals. So the comparator output, the comparator input. Um, you know, even the timer mm -hmm. output, that kind of thing. You can tie these to a variety of number of, uh, of pins on the device. And what the pin manager does is it shows you what pins are available. Uh, some pins you can share with other peripherals, some pins you can't. And the, um, the pin manager really shows that to you uh, instantaneously. If you weren't aware of this um, and you were doing this strictly in code, you know, you may assign a couple of things to a pin and it may not work and you're not sure why, that's bench testing, that's time, that's money for, for you to spend. Yeah, okay. and I use that function a lot. Like I just use the pin manager to route some signals out and, and do some probe on it. And again, this, this uh, having this selectable pin out really helps with your layout complexity. Yeah. If you have an existing design and you're going to swap out to upgrade the chip on there, this mm -hmm. minimizes the board rework, yes. which can save you a ton of cash. Yeah. You know? So basically, with this functionality we call PPS, Peripheral Pin Select, uh, every digital output can be routed to any of the digital pins in your MCU. Very cool. Yeah. OK. So uh, we'll send this back to the booth. Matt, um, I think we're, that's pretty much it with the demo. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Mark. I know that I learned a ton even today listening to what you guys are talking about. A lot of cool and a lot of digital features to take back. Is that a metric ton or <laughs> just, uh, just a regular know, ton? Just a regular one. Okay. Just a regular ton. Cool. Um, but yeah, so I know we promised you guys all a gift, uh, and so we will throw it up. There we go. Thank you, Wayne. I'm. Uh, You're just antsy with the microphone. I right? am. We, we, I am. We, we do want the people to hear you. I would prefer that, yes. Um, <laughs> but so if you guys check out the link that we're throwing up on the bottom of the screen, um, that's for the PIC 16F 1884 or 1844. Yeah. One eight, PIC 16F 18446. And actually, there it is. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, David to set up on the uh, on Daniel's board again. If he if he has an opportunity, we'll I'll switch over. There you go. So that so. red blinky board right there. We're going to be. We actually uh, have a f link that you guys can all run to and go grab a free one of those boards. And so you can start you working with a microwave click. You can start working with any number of other sensors, um, doing essentially the same thing that Daniel was showing us how to do today, um, but with whatever project you need to take back uh, to your next application or just doing something around the house, hobbyist, whatever you may need to do, I think we can all probably learn a few things from today. That's right. And uh, all you have to do is sign up on that website uh, below. It's, and, and I'm not going to try and massacre the URL. Actually, I think it is uh, microchip.com slash pick or slash 
one eight four free board or something like that. We'll we'll have it in it's the description. A, Don't worry. It's in the description. Yep. So make sure you guys all check that out. I also want to give a special shout out to, and I hope I'm saying this right, Radix Electra, Radix Electra, something like that. Um, but thank you for all your great questions today. If you shoot us an email at livestream at microchip dot com, we'll make sure to send you uh, an extra special board or something like that. Shoot us an email and we'll get working on that. I really appreciate all the great questions that you had for us today. Thank um, you. As usual, make sure that you guys are subscribing to our page, that everybody out there is subscribing. Everybody is subscribing on Facebook. We found out recently we have an Instagram account. <laughs> no, we already knew. I mean, we, we, we knew, the, we knew, but uh, that's a, no got worries. some great content on it. New boards, fun little way to follow us on there. Twitter. We're on Twitter. If there's something else new coming out, we'll figure it out and we'll be on there as well. Sorry. All of so, all of the social media channels. Let's just go ahead and call it that. All the social media channels. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Mark, uh, I don't see any more questions on the feed. So why don't you uh, take us home? Sure. Uh, just to point out a couple of things, folks. Um, uh, more information on this content. Um, a great app note that just came out. Um, and we're going to put links later in the comments section. Uh, but one app note if you want to head out and, and just go to microchip.com and search for it is A as in alpha, N as in November, 2551. And this is called Noise Countermeasures for A to D ADC Applications. And it does a great job of stepping you through how to take a noisy signal using the new A to D on the ATmega 4809 and actually filter that signal, use some averaging on it, kind of like what Daniel was talking about today, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know work with that and just clean up the signal so you get a more accurate analog input. Uh, there's a lot of other great app notes on there. Two product pages you're going to want to visit are the ATmega 4809 page, uh, the PIC16F18446 is another great product. Um, these have these new A to Ds on them uh, that really have these unique capabilities. Uh, as always, there's also the developer help wiki, uh, and there's the MPLAB Express, which is our online version of MPLAB X IDE. There's a ton of examples up there, yes. including a bunch of analog to digital converter with computation examples. The start uh, a graphical interface environment at start.atmel.com. This is where you can actually go in and browse through a bunch of examples based on ABRs. Um, and that's a great resource as well. Yeah, and uh, as, as you speak, we're popping these up in the comment section. Wonderful. And they'll also be in the description, so you don't have to remember, and, you, and Mark doesn't have to spell correctly. <laughs> Which I <laughs> rarely do. Uh, and uh, the other thing, too, is, Daniel, this example is going to be... Yes, it's I'm, not I'm yet, working but on it's, the tutorial, and uh, it's going to walk you through step by step. And that'll be on, on the Express website, correct? Yes. Okay, so microchip.com forward slash express no e x press um okay cool uh any <laughs> that was a lot <laughs> that was a lot yeah. anything else to add daniel that's it pretty much it thanks for joining me my friend thank I you i appreciate it thanks to everyone else for joining us and we'll see you next time thank you <laughs>